I, do I have regrets? No. I have some. I regret ever having heard of this show. Remember that the writers were in control of this the entire time and they absolutely could have had this moment seasons ago and you could have had whole seasons of actual romantic relationship between these two characters and you didn't. Hello everyone, it's Rowan. Uh, I did not think I was gonna be making another video this soon, but I was, you know, just minding my own business, doom scrolling at 2 a.m. last night and uh, suddenly Destiel started trending. So I guess we're doing this and I am taking you along for the ride. Now for disclosure, uh, I have not seen Supernatural in quite a few years. I used to watch it like back in its heyday um, and I was trying to remember how many seasons I had seen and I know <laughs> that I have seen at least seven of them because I own the DVD box set and I remember distinctly when I bought it thinking do I want to buy this now because it's a lot of money and you know in the next couple of years you know the final two or three seasons are going to air and then I'll have to buy those separately like two or three seasons, what a fool. Back when I watched it, I did ship Destiel, not in the way that I thought they were ever gonna be canon, but kind of like I read fic, so I've definitely read that fic. Although I have been out of the fandom so long that like that fic could totally have changed, there could be new ones. Feel free to leave fic recommendations in the comments. So all I know about this episode going in is the like minute and a half clip I saw on Twitter of Castiel saying I love you to Dean, but I have also heard that he uh, dies immediately afterwards, which you know, it's the most supernatural thing I've ever heard. And one last note before we dive in, um, if you have found this video through like the supernatural fandom rather than knowing my uh, other stuff, I do a lot of media analysis, queer media analysis. So I will be talking about various tropes that it employs and kind of the wider landscape of representation because I can't help it, but this is not a scripted video. I've not really prepped for this. We're just, we're doing it off the cuff and we're seeing what happens. I'm fully aware I might be about to watch this whole episode and there will only be one minute of actual Destiel content, but. Oh my God, a black woman in Supernatural? She's probably evil. Oh, well, RIP to you, young man. Like I kind of knew in my head when I decided to watch this episode and react to it that there was not gonna be a lot of Destiel in it just because I know, I mean, maybe I have a preconceived idea about what's gonna be going on and I know there's two more episodes left, but I fully believe that this is not a genuine like, oh, Destiel is canon, they're going to get together, they're going to both confess their love for each other and it's going to be like confirmed to be romantic and not the kind of like, bro, I love you, you're like a brother to me. There's only two episodes of this show left and they're introducing new lore. This is ridiculous. Dean's been thrown across the room. This was a perfect moment for Castiel to go to him and Sam to go to Jack. He doesn't, he goes to Jack, so. I mean, to be fair, Jack was just blown up, so whatever. I'm just saying, if you wanted to put in some subtext, that's where you would do it. So I think what's really interesting is looking at other emotional scenes that aren't between like Dean and Castiel and trying to work out um, uh, how much uh, the audience is projecting on their romantic subtext um, versus how much it is there because it's different to other emotional confrontations or you know confessions or moments in the show which aren't romantically coded charlie oh my goodness back when i knew charlie she was just like a real she was basically just felicia day uh, yeah, but a lesbian hideout after the sun goes down three to four shifters perfect size for just us okay she's a hunter so and like so is her date. girlfriend yeah like a date oh a date are they new is this new this is cute one of them's oh gonna die clearly Told ya. it's supernatural every morning for the rest this of is time. going too well oh here we go she's got she's disappeared she's she's gone She better not stay gone, that's ridiculous. If you were genuinely building this script as Cass and Dean having that kind of relationship with each other, they've set up two romantic couples where one of them has disappeared. There would be some kind of scene in which it was uh, subtextually hinted or that there was some kind of tension with them worried about the, the same thing happening to the other one. Um, even knowing their own feelings, you know, knowing that that's why they were worried or being confused about why they were specifically worried about that other one person in particular and kind of having that realization of romantic feelings come from that i'll go with you dean oh i'll go with All you right. dean okay okay maybe i spoke too soon maybe we are gonna get some build up to this 
confession. I think it's also interesting to note that when I was, even when I was watching the show, there were moments where people were reading romantic meaning into lines from Dean and Castiel to each other that weren't I love you, but they were ways of showing that they were special to each other or that they cared about each other. Um, and yeah, so I'm just worried that the, uh, the I love you is a, it's, it's, it's a line that can mean lots of different things. And how far it is explicitly romantic. This is what I'm hoping to figure out by actually watching the episode. Okay, so we're getting them together, but it's not any kind of emotional stuff. Like they're on a mission, not talking, ready to fight. Oh shit. How very end game of them. <laughs> I love it, she's just like, oh, I fell over. Oh, I'm getting back up again. <laughs> this is great. So this idea of like, introducing this plot point that people have been waiting for when it's almost the end of the entire show. It's giving me a lot of flashback vibes to another uh, fandom. But the frustration with Merlin is that we didn't get to see the fallout of the confession that he had magic. But like that storyline had been building for a while. We had confirmation that he had magic that was like putting it through and they didn't just at the end throw in a, oh, by the way, I'm in love with uh, King Arthur. And what's kind of confusing about this is that as far as I know, there has not been any build up canonically of Dean and Cass's relationship. There's not been any, you know, Dean confessing to Sam how he feels, but not feeling like he can talk to Cassiel about it or them having like a moment together that they then brush off because it's like the apocalypse is more important. Like there's been nothing like that. It's all been the subtext that people who are fans of the show have kind of been like, oh, this this could be actual subtext. But then a load of people who watch the show are like, no, it's not. So it's not been, not been certain. It's not been developed in that way. There's not been conversations had that have made it explicit in the way that Merlin had for his like magic reveal. Can you tell I feel like I've been burned by Supernatural before, so I'm not giving them any <laughs> benefit of the doubt. I'll try, I'll try. I'll come, I'll come at it with some, come for the rest of the episode with benefit of the doubt, I promise. Yeah. Is there gonna be like a plea for the loved one from cast? Oh, no, they had a plan, I guess? I'm really, basically what I'm looking for is romantic tropes. Uh, peppered into the episode, like little hints or things like that. But then also the nature of queer baiting is to include elements of queer coding or romance coding to suggest that something is happening without making it canon, so. She's gonna kill you, and then she's gonna kill me. Here we go, deathbed confession. There's no more hope. I guess I gotta say it. There's one thing strong enough to stop her. The power of love. I, I made a deal to save him. You would? The, the price was my life. When I experienced a moment of true happiness, the empty would be summoned and it would take me forever. Oh, okay, okay. Moment of true happiness. I wondered what it could be, what what my okay, true happiness okay, could even look okay, like. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, now. Me shooting the most in this scene. Happiness isn't in okay. the having. It's in just being. Okay. It's in just saying it. Okay, this is a great way of them not having to do that? it, but sure. The context of this is adding a little bit more, a little more, more spice to it. Because you cared. At the I very cared. least, Misha is, Misha is playing this like you. a romantic. I cared about Sam, I cared about Jack. Why does this sound like a goodbye? Okay. Because it is. I love you. There it is. And now he's dead. <laughs> I love you, I'm gonna die. <laughs> then you just say it back, Dean. You just have to say... Goodbye, Dean. Dean is constantly being pushed over. Oh, the hand on his... Mwah, the chef's kiss on that. Let's be real in this show. He might not be. But if he's actually dead. We'll talk about that in a second. I wanna keep watching this before we get into the analysis element. Oh, and Dean's crying. Okay. 
So let's talk about this. So I've made a couple of notes to order my thoughts, but a lot of this is just gonna be my initial reaction to what I've just seen. Um, I will say right now, that was actually more than I expected. Um, I had seen on Twitter beforehand just the uh, isolated clip of the I love you, um, but not necessarily the whole of the speech beforehand. And I do think that that speech, particularly with the knowledge of Cass's um, like deal or curse that he has around his happiest moment, definitely puts more of a romantic spin on it. I think that Misha's acting definitely felt like it was trying to veer in that direction. And there is the possibility that in the final two episodes, because I think there's two more episodes to go, that it will be like officially canon, like it will be explicitly said that it was a romantic I love you, that this is how Cass feels about Dean. That remains to be seen. Some things, however, about that scene that maybe will persuade some people that it wasn't necessarily romantic, especially people who aren't sort of in fandom and into Destiel, who are just kind of watching it as casual viewers. Um, Dean's reaction was pretty muted, to say the least. At the end, obviously, he's crying in the bunker, but there is nothing to separate those tears from, I'm all alone, there's no hope, I'm in the darkest hour of this plot line, um, my best friend has died, sort of stuff. And there is also that line around, like, I care about you, I care about Sam, I care about like and lists other people that he cares about, which interestingly enough reminds me of a scene in an actually canonically queer sci-fi supernatural show that is uh, Torchwood. Uh, there is a scene in which Jack returns and he does his whole, I came back for you, for all of you, um, which is before him and Yanto sort of officially become a proper couple. Um, but that was used within that show like explicitly to start hinting at the idea of them wanting to start to develop a romantic relationship between these characters that did end up becoming canon across multiple seasons. So I'm not saying that this was like a reference or anything in this episode of Supernatural, but I think it's interesting that the same technique of like deflection um, can be used in Torchwood in like an explicitly building to a romantic relationship kind of scene. And also in this scene, but it seems to be more used to dampen slightly the romantic overtones. At least that's how it read to me. I also want to say something about this happiest moment bit and particularly the idea that Cass says around the idea of like the happiest moment doesn't have to be like a thing that you do it can just be a thing that you say like he doesn't have to he can just say I love you he doesn't actually have to have it either reciprocated or have it act on it in any way which let's be clear if this is the real world right if Dean and Cass are real people maybe the apocalypse isn't happening, maybe there's some other element of, you know, like a terminal illness, something like that, in which this will be happening. That's a fine thing for someone to say to someone else, that's a fine way for it to go. However, this is a fictional TV show in which there are writers who control these characters. The characters don't control themselves. So the writers have specifically chosen for a character to say, oh, it totally doesn't matter if we never actually do anything gay, I'll just say it in this one scene. I may be projecting, maybe in the next two episodes we'll have some more to this whole plot line. Um, but I do think that it's like, it's important to note that these are not real people, these are writers, uh, characters that writers have written and have chosen for this to happen. They have chosen to have this scene happen in the third to last episode of the entire show, when these are characters who have existed and have had noticeable tension that fans have picked up on for 10 years now, right? There's been that many seasons that this could have been developed in and it wasn't which I think is very important to note. So I haven't gone on Tumblr myself, um, ironically, because there is a, another show that I haven't had time to watch that I don't want to be spoiled for <laughs> because I've been doing this. Um, but I've people have sent me screenshots and I've seen on Twitter and I think that there is a really interesting subsection of people who see this as like a big victory um, for Desiel for representation, all that kind of stuff. And I think in, in a way, if it does become canon, obviously that is, really great for people who've been watching the show and, and trying to kind of feel vindication and finally seeing it becoming canon. But ultimately, like, remember that the writers were in control of this the entire time and they absolutely could have had this moment seasons ago and you could have had whole seasons of actual romantic relationship between these two characters. And you didn't. Not because the characters are real people and they decided what was gonna happen and they wanted to wait, because the writers decided to do that. And why would they decide to do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about queer baiting. So if you're watching this video, I'm assuming either you are in the Supernatural fandom or you already subscribed to me. If you already subscribed to me, you will have heard me talk about queer baiting, I'm sure at one point or another. If you are in the Supernatural fandom, 
I'm sure you are familiar with the concept at least. Just in case you aren't completely certain what it is, uh, I'm gonna try and give a very concise definition. If you want to hear me talk about it more, I have a whole video on queer baiting, queer coding and queer catching, uh, which you can check out if you wanna learn a bit more about this phenomenon through film history. But essentially it is, um, the technique that is employed by a writer on a TV show, film, any kind of fictional media. Um, the purpose of which is basically to toe the line between not alienating either a queer audience or a more conservative or homophobic audience by having characters who, for a queer audience, can be read as gay, seem like they might be gay or queer, but because it isn't confirmed in canon, it also doesn't alienate these more conservative or homophobic viewers who might be uh, tempted to switch off or even boycott the show very vocally if it suddenly introduced a queer lead character. One of the ways that you kind of get away with this is because we are used to, within straight media, the idea of the will they won't they relationship where um, it is entirely possible at the end of that will they won't they storyline for them to get together. There is not really any reason to stop two straight people getting together within a show. However, because viewers, including queer viewers, are so used to that will they won't they element, I think that some people potentially naively will continue watching something that has a will they won't they element with potentially queer characters thinking that it has the same odds as a straight couple to become canon by the end which historically it does not. Now queer baiting also has a kind of interesting relationship with stuff outside of a show or a, t or a movie itself so like interviews with the cast, convention appearances, the way that the show is promoted um, that often will lean into the queer bait element for people like in the know who are looking for it but again doesn't alienate someone who might be put off by that. And one of the reasons why it's so tricky is obviously until a show is done you can't tell whether you have been baited in a way because they can always say oh you know it could it could be coming though like next season oh it's going to it's going to happen and equally people can say mm, that you're just seeing things that aren't there they're not deliberately trying to trick you you're just reading too much into it so yeah it's a complicated one and it is one that Destiel has been at the center of since it kind of entered the the concept of queer baiting entered mainstream discourse like Destiel has been the ultimate example of it like we've had multiple scenes in which they have talked to each other in a way that if it had been a straight couple would probably have been seen as extremely romantic in terms of how much they mean to each other. So Supernatural was part of the uh, so-called Super Hulock fandoms, these really huge dominating fandoms uh, on Tumblr in the kind of early uh, 2010s. I think there were lots of reasons why these fandoms were particularly popular but uh, one reason that I think links quite well into this was the relationship between fans and the actors and creators and, and people on the show. Like actors on the show did a ton of convention appearances and not just traditional kind of comic con conventions where they come out onto a panel and they have a couple of Q&A questions with the audience and leave. They would have these tickets where people would like have breakfast with the stars of the show. Um, they would do panels that were not really anything to do with the show itself. They would just talk about themselves and their lives and like joke around with the audience. There was this idea of like feeling connected to those actors which spilled out into the discourse around queer baiting. So for example there were rumours that the actor who plays Dean had explicitly said that he did not want to play a queer character and I think that that kind of more open relationship between the creators and the actors and the fans of the show um, had a side effect of people being much more ready to speculate about what was going on behind the scenes and who was making these decisions than other examples of queer baiting that I've seen. So like when I was back watching Supernatural there were a ton of rumours and speculation around like which actor had like blocked the Destiel becoming canon, which actor was in support of it, who was feuding, like all this kind of stuff was so part of the fandom and the relationship to the text itself. But the thing with queer baiting is like you don't want to be seen to be doing it. You don't want to admit that you've done it. And you also can't prove that it's been done deliberately. And so unless you have a situation where, you know, like the show or the film has been like released years ago and people are talking about it more as like a cult hit or doing an, you know, an oral history of it or going back and like interviewing where are they now style with the actors or the directors or writers. You know, in those circumstances, we've seen people come out and say, oh, you know, this is what was actually going on behind the scenes. This is why that decision was made. But like the show is still airing. We are not going to have someone come out and be like, yep, no, we, we were definitely queer baiting the audience. That was absolutely something we talked about in the writer's room. But also like it's been 10 years, they definitely know no one has been quiet around the idea of Destiel. No one has, like, 
people have definitely been talking to them about the idea of like oh we've read this scene as queer this particular relationship reads this way this particular like acting choice or scripting choice really reads in a queer way like they definitely know so at the moment everything that we have as viewers is speculation in terms of like decisions that have been made when they were made why they were made all that kind of stuff and like we may never know the reasoning behind the decision to have this scene in this particular episode, to have it at all, what the meaning is. I think the only way that we're gonna find out is if they actually explicitly have a conversation or a voiceover or something within the show in the next two episodes that is explicitly, you know, making it so that there is no way that anyone can have like plausible deniability or anyone in the audience can say that they missed it. Which brings me on to, I guess, the second massive trope that this is a part of, which is the bury your gaze trope. Wow, we just... <laughs> they really were hitting it out of the park this episode with like, if you were to ask someone to design the most stereotypical death scene, for a queer character. Like it would be this whole scene where you have both queer baiting kind of uh, a not necessarily explicit uh, confession and then a, a bury your gaze death immediately afterwards. Where not only does the person die, but like goes to what, from people in the fandom that have talked about it, seems to be like super hell. So again with the bury your gaze trope, I have talked about this at length. In fact, my last uh, video that was about Bly Manor touched on it more deeply, but essentially it is the killing off of queer characters, specifically how disproportionately high the percentage of queer versus straight characters who get killed off is, uh, and also the reasons why they get killed off being linked to their sexuality. And like this very literally, like explicitly Cass says, that he is going to die because he has experienced his happiest moment, which is saying I love you to Dean. So like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. And this is actually like a really classic, very well known, especially in this genre, way of doing the bury your gaze trope, which is that you have a love confession or a, a reunion between characters or a reconciliation of some kind, and then the death happens. Um, almost immediately afterwards. So we have uh, Lexa in The 100. We have Tara in Buffy. Like this is not some wild fluke. There is no way that they didn't know about this. There is no way. But as I just said, we can't prove that they knew it. So it's just this really, like I was genuinely, I, I if I was still invested in this show, I would probably be annoyed and frustrated. But as someone who has left it behind for the just ridiculous trash it is, I just find it hysterical. Like, the, like, this has to be a joke. This is hilarious. And one of the funniest things about it is a friend of mine is sending me stuff from Tumblr now, so I'm not getting spoiled for uh, anything by going on there myself. And so many people are like, it's there's a really interesting split between people who are seeing it as this like crazy, like amazing victory of like, Dusty Ellis Cannon, like amazing, this is so good, queer rights. And then the people who mm, kind of fall more on my side who are a bit like, this is like the most homophobic <laughs> <laughs> coming out that we've ever seen if that's what it actually is. Like with the bury your gaze element, I almost don't know whether it's better or worse for, for that to actually have been a romantic love confession because I guess if it wasn't, then they just buried a straight. So yeah, for me, the real question is gonna be in these next two episodes, what happens, right? Because we have so many paths we can go down, especially because it's supernatural and they love to resurrect people constantly. The entire like actual plot line of this episode was about how someone wants to kill all of the people who have been resurrected over the years. Like it's a clearly, an, it's a pandemic in their world. So we have Cass comes back or Cass stays dead. That feels like a pretty one or the other kind of option for the next two episodes. So with either of those options, they could choose to just not mention it again, right? Like this happens, but you know, Dean doesn't say to Sam, oh, by the way, Cass said something crazy to me before he like went to super hell. The writers will just like let it be a thing that happened and people who are invested in Destiel can be like, it's canon. And people who uh, are a bit more skeptical like me can be like, really, that was, that's how you're gonna do it? Okay, I guess. And people who maybe are not so quick to read into queer stuff will be like, oh, what an amazing confession from that angel who is made of pure love to his best friend. <laughs> Something else that could happen, whether Cass come back or not, is that Dean could confirm or deny his own feelings. Or I guess go in the middle, like he could say to Sam what Cass said and, and Sam could be like, how do you feel about that Dean? And he could do like a, I don't know, I wish we'd had more time. You know, that kind of vibe. If Cass does come back, as well as those options, we obviously also have the option of like him actually getting to 
have some kind of romantic reciprocation, a kiss, dare I even suggest it? Like I wouldn't bet anything past the writers, but I genuinely think the only way that they could add to the hysterical humour of this whole situation of like the most homophobic gay reveal of all time would be if they got cast to come back and then Dean was like, I don't feel the same way. And that was how they, <laughs> that's how they ended the show. <laughs> but like, we have to remember, there are two episodes to go. Whatever they have, there is not going to be any like long-standing consequences or us like seeing them in a relationship. There's not gonna be any payoff basically. And this is difficult to talk about again because we do not know what was going on inside the writer's heads. We can only speculate, but like, I do not believe no, no single cell in my body believes that this was the plan the whole time. There is no part of me, like there was a decision made. There was a point in time in which they were like, I guess we're gonna have Cass love Dean romantically, if that's what they are going for. That was 100% not a thing that they were deciding to do 10 years ago and they just decided until the last two episodes to actually make it happen. That's not, that's not what went on here. Like I know I mentioned Merlin before when I was actually watching, but it's such a Merlin ending, Jesus. And that was, I mean, the Merlin end. If you haven't seen the Merlin ending, I don't even know what to tell you. We'll see whether the actual ending of this show lives up to the, the wild ride that was having a show in which the entire like tension between the lead characters was one of them had magic and the other one hated magic. And then not actually having the one with magic reveal that he had magic until literally the end of the, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And that show also had like a deathbed confession of like love slash friendship slash caring about each other. There was like no payoff. And I and it's just so funny to me that this is now going on that same route, <laughs> Jesus. So I was originally just gonna react to Destiel in terms of the show, but I've just looked at my phone and my friend has sent me approximately 40 Tumblr posts. So I'm also gonna react to other people's reactions to Destiel because I just find this thing so funny. And Twitter is where I originally saw it, as I mentioned, and that I think is more full of people who are older and who maybe were like used to be fans of Supernatural, kind of like me, dropped off. Whereas on Tumblr, it's probably, I imagine, gonna be a mix of people who are like me, hadn't stopped watching the show, and people who have watched it all the way through. And I am fascinated to see what people think. So let's have a look at the memes, shall we? <laughs> Oh my God, the super hulak man, what a wild ride. De Destiel Putin election tumbler. 2020 is the wildest year. Nowhere on the 2020 bingo card did we have this on there. We should have known, it should have been a thing that we, that we saw coming. Supernatural immediately after recording a take of the confession scene where they successfully stopped Jensen Ackles from saying slurs. See, okay, so this is what I'm talking about. People who were convinced that, Jens that Jensen was like secretly homophobic or like, and I, and I don't really know how far this is like a meme where people are just joking around about it versus how far people genuinely believe that he's homophobic and was like, I've, I saw a meme where someone had done that face app thing where you like edit a picture so that someone's smiling and had it as like, oh, I fixed Dean in that scene where Cass was confessing his love to him. Cause yeah, I think that the big thing about that scene, Misha was doing the most, but it was Jensen's um, non-reaction that I don't know whether they were going, if we're giving them the benefit of the doubt, it's gonna be confirmed in the next episodes. And it was just like them giving it a bit of like, oh, it's it's still a will they, won't they? Like what's Dean really think about this confession? But like the uh, acting choice wise, it wasn't exactly a, I've always wanted you to tell me that, or no, don't let this be the moment that you tell me what I've always wanted to hear. And then you have to leave me. Like there was none of that. There was like, Dean didn't say anything other than like, don't do this Cass. Supernatural is the world's longest hate crime. <laughs> Like, here's the thing, even if, even if they make it canon in the last two episodes, I got, like, we can't, we can't reward them for that. We can't say that that's good. That's not good. They, they gave you three episodes, two episodes, two and a scene episodes. They had 10 years. Don't you praise them for that bullshit. Even Destiel went canon before Nevada finished counting the ballots. The fact that this all happened when the election was happening, it's, I was honestly the, hysterical laughter that I needed last night at 3 a.m. I love, <laughs> yes, this is, I love how everyone else is like picking up on the same stuff that I picked up on in the like, in my initial reaction to it. I feel like everyone's having like a hive mind experience of how ridiculous this whole thing is. Is he, you know, just just downward to super hell. 
She sent me a Merlin meme. There's a Merlin meme. Okay, now that Destiel is canon and 2020 is a mess, can we have Arthur coming back to life to stay with Merlin? Perfect year for him to show up and save the world. You know what, I'm also gonna link down below um, a video that my friend Gemma did, who is an absolute gem. She's done a like, how, one, a how Merlin should have ended and a how Merlin should have come out, where she genuinely like scripted an entire episode of the show and it's perfection and she acts it out and it's just, I'm obsessed with it. You should absolutely go and watch it because it will be better than this episode of Supernatural. I said what I said. I saw that Supernatural Destiel clip. It was like witnessing two actors who were asked to act out a gay confession as homophobically as possible. I need to call the Southern Poverty Law set. <laughs> We all have the same mind. We all know exactly what's happening. The supernatural writers took the burial gay tropes a whole new level. Like this shit's the funniest thing to me. They legit made him canonically gay and then killed him immediately after he confesses because he felt happy while confessing. Exactly what I said, exactly what I said. I had to do this video now because I was like, I can't, I have to exercise this from my body. I cannot also be invested in these next two episodes. I'm gonna, they're gonna trend as well, aren't they? There's gonna be some other bullshit. What other homophobic tropes can we throw into the mix? I wonder. Maybe in the next two weeks we will find out. I'm now I'm genuinely like, what could they do that would be worse? The one where like, d the there's some like scene at the end with like, like force ghosts, you know what I mean? From Star Wars, uh, or like Harry, the force ghost from Harry Potter. <laughs> When, when it's like, oh, the world's gonna end and like Cass is just in a crowd of other dead people. That would be great. If we have like a sad instrumental of Carry On My Wayward Son and it just shows everyone like where everyone is and Cass is just in super hell crying. In summary, it, it, there's no good on the scale of what has happened here today. There is no part of the decisions that the writers made that I would say is positive. Even if this turns out to be a romantic confession and then the next episode Dean also confesses, like the decision to wait 10 years to do this, in my opinion, negates any of the positives. I, do I have regrets? No. I have some. I regret ever having heard of this show and buying this fucking four DVD box. I honestly wanna hear all your thoughts. I wanna hear all your memes about this below because they did not give what I would consider to be meaningful representation in that you can't just say it and not have it be done. And then in your own script, comment on the fact that you aren't actually doing it, you're just saying it. Thank you so much for making it this far through the video. Um, if you aren't already subscribed uh, and you like this, feel free to. Um, for a little taste of videos that are coming up, uh, later this month we have Disney and the AIDS crisis. Um, I'm doing videos on gay superheroes, which obviously if you're into uh, being disappointed by uh, non-canonical, queer ships uh, will absolutely be the video for you. There's lots going on. I'm also really excited. I'm working with some other video essayists on some like collab essays where we, like I discuss a topic and they come in with their particular area of expertise for like a little, uh, little section, a little case study, which is really fun. If you would like to help support me make these videos, then I'll leave a link to my Patreon below along with all my social media. So you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.